yeah, it's still a masterpiece. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, we figured we could either so see the possession crappy uh, pose the crappy possession movie, or we can go see one of the best movies of all time. And I have <laughs> never seen Schindler's List, which yeah. is a sin as a film major. Yeah, so we went to go see Schindler's List, and it's still really goddamn good. <laughs> yeah, that was that was. I don't think I've seen this movie since like my late teens, early twenties. So it's been at least seven years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you've never seen it at all, so what did you think? No, I, f I loved it. Yeah. I mean, like, really well done, you know, kind of, in you know, interesting in terms of, you know, like, the cinematography, the c the content matter and all that. Yeah. Like, finding ways to find, like, humanity and redemption in a lot of these, like, more messed up areas. Mm-hmm. That's uh, film's still a goddamn masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I cut I, you off there again. No, I, got, I agree. It's like, uh. there were a couple of small Spielberg moments that kind of stood out but other than that it's like it was even then, well acted this... well characterized mm -hmm. uh really well written like this... even then they're like oh, I'm sorry go ahead yeah it's it's like just there's so little fault to this movie yeah like even like I wouldn't even say like the Spielbergisms that are in this movie are are still justified in this case compared to yeah. some of his other films. No, agree. It's like uh, I mean there were a couple that felt a little awkward, like when they compiled the list for the second factory, for example. That uh, kind of that comment about like how the margins are life and all that I was like, okay, that's a little. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, like this is as like and compared to like other movies he made, like uh, what's the movie he made last year, The Post. Oh, okay, yeah, Where I can see. I was thinking of Bridge of Spies. Or Bridge of Spies, too. I would but, say, like, like the messages tend to be a little bit too self-indulgent. Yeah, this, one, this was completely justified. Yeah, like, that's, like, this feels justified. This feels like, yeah, if you're going to do that in any one of these movies, it definitely feels like it should be here. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about one of, the great, one of the greatest, like, the most horrific accidents ever taken by yeah. any or governmental organization. Uh, yeah, I feel like you've earned that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, like, Watch this movie again after after at least seven years of having not having not seen it. Um, it's, it's kind of weird looking back on it because one thing I the one thing that thought that kept reoccurring to me throughout this movie is like you know if it's made by today, uh, Schindler would be played by Mad Mikkelsen. I could see that. Right. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> uh, that's what I was thinking. Is like Liam Neeson is kind of acting like Mad Mikkelsen here. Granted, way before he got a limelight, so there's no way. <laughs> but. Uh, no, like, one thing that I thought was very interesting in this one, like, this is very, like, even with the Spielbergisms that are in this movie, it's still very restrained. It's yeah. very careful with how it presents the subject matter, and they mm -hmm. mean extremely careful. Yeah. And a good easy way to tell that is, one, how it's shot. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's, like, it's not, it's very constrained, very, you know, not even constrained, like, it, it knows what, it, it knows what needs to be shown. It's presented very matter-of-fact. Yeah. Like, it's, it takes great care not to over dramatize anything. It presents it exactly as is. And you also know where you can tell that it's that's what they're going for is notice how there's almost no music for the most of the entire movie. Well, I didn't even realize. That's something I realized in the second viewing. It's like anytime there is a part in the labor camp or anything like that, there's no music. There's no soundtrack. Yeah. It's completely silent. Or like when they're t when they're going through the ghettos, anything that involves the segregation and persecution of Jewish people, there's almost no soundtrack. There's only a two exceptions to this, I noticed. One was in the burning the bodies uh, about ha about two hours into the movie. Yeah. Uh, which is and, and which kind of makes sense thematically because that's like the turning point for Schindler where he realizes that's when he like there's no redemption for these people in any way whatsoever. Who at this point is trying desperately to like either justify or deny what's going on to try to save his own skin, basically. Um, and then after that, the only music that occurs during the sequences is during the some of the Auschwitz scenes. Yeah, they present. There's some soundtrack you there mean near the end. There, yeah, towards the end when yeah. they when they're going to what you think is the gas chamber. Yeah, that uh, ooh, that scene. Yeah, that scene. And I remember uh, someone told me something different. I think I got the two movies confused. I was like, oh no, it's this part. Yeah, I remember watching this. Like that's the scene I do remember watching the first time. Going, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> are we are, like? Are they gonna show this? Because at this point, the movie's been pretty clear cut. Of like, yeah, we're gonna just again, we're not gonna over dramatize anything. We're gonna show it exactly as is and let it speak for itself. Which I, I respect the shit out of this movie for doing. 
Uh, it's a Spielberg movie that I don't think he's ever made anything before this or uh, like anything even close to it afterwards. The like, close to be like Saving Private Ryan, maybe. Yeah. Uh, or maybe Green. No, no, Green didn't do Screen Mile. Um, yeah, because that was. Um, oh God, that was the guy who did The Mist uh, and Walking Dead. The guy who created it. Ooh. That Robert Kirkman. No, I mean the guy who made who adapted the TV show. Why am I still getting his name? Shawshank Redemption. Arg. Stephen King. No. I mean, they were all Stephen King <laughs> stuff, but... Oh my well, not, God. Ro- not Walking Dead, but... Uh, Why am I forgetting this guy's name? It's going to bug the crap out of me. Anyway, while well, you're looking at that. Um, but yeah, so like, it, like, especially when you get to the part when they're evacuating the ghetto, there is a solid 20 or so minutes where there is, like, bare minimum dialogue, and it's all, like... And that's one thing I think this movie's a masterpiece, and more than anything else, is the visual storytelling. Yeah. The visual storytelling is unbelievable in yeah, this they, film. It lets it lets the atrocity speak for itself. And it they're like and that's exactly the way something like this should be done. It's in a way that's beyond dispute. That you can't say, yeah. oh well they played this up for the movie. It's like, no, this is the shit that happened and we're gonna play it as yeah. is and we're gonna make you feel every second of it. We don't have to do a damn thing. Yeah. And that's the uh, thing that was also kind of interesting is like they somehow found ways to make things more and more deplorable as time went on. Mm-hmm. I was like not Bravo in the literal sense, just Bravo movie for like I like, said, it's it's great visual storytelling. Yeah, um, and how it just kind of like makes you fear what's going to happen next. So, like mm-hmm. I said, the thing where they went to the shower, so they're going to get gassed. Yeah, where it's just like, ah! well, like what makes movies so brilliant is the fact that when you really break down the actual screenplay, there's not a lot of dialogue in this movie, and this movie is three hours long. Yeah, uh, and that's because like not, like about I want to say a solid seventy five percent of this movie is just the visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, yeah, there's like talking in the bits there, but like most of it's like it's done through just show, uh, like show don't tell. Yeah. Where like uh, the talking's meant to build the characters, but in terms of like a lot of the other things that happen, in terms of like what they're going through, that's all visual. Yeah, uh, like especially the parts of the ghettos, uh, especially in the part in the labor camps, uh, especially in the part in Auschwitz when the, it, it really matters. Uh, and this is actually very interesting watching the movie now because I'm just in the middle of reading Mouse. Have you ever read that book? I read the first book. There's uh, more than one. I, yeah, there's two. I think I've got. I think I got the collection. Okay, and you uh, got them all. Because yeah, I read it in my uh, English ca- my English class in uh, at my in high school. Yeah, I'm reading it for the first time now, so that's when I. Uh, yes. So it's kind of reading, watching that, and also realizing that in that book they're all rats, and I didn't get why until they said until uh, fucking Voldemort. Yeah. Uh, says you don't have the eyes of a rat, and my brain went, oh, I. Get it now, and I felt kind of guilty for taking that long to get it. Um, <laughs> uh, f- f- can we talk about him for a bit? Yeah, <laughs> one of the most disgusting villains in all of cinema. Yeah, uh, who I guess has come up into the end, I guess, but at the same time, like not over the course of the actual film. <laughs> Uh, it's only in the end credit, uh, like the end, like yeah. here's what happened to everyone yeah, kind epilogue. of thing. Epilogue. Thank you. Uh, I have, I can do words today. <sighs> yeah, by the way, the guy was Frank Darabont. Uh, who the who, one that we were trying to think about? The oh, guy. okay, okay, okay. Um, the one who did uh, Green Mile. Okay, so. okay, okay. Uh, but like, yeah, if you want to like pick somebody who like who they just portray this complex portrait of a sick, sick man. Uh, the writing of this character is also like absolutely brilliant in its depravity. Uh, if that, if that makes sense, it's like yeah. even when we're just doing something like just stretching outside, like with the shirt off and the jumpers on, it's still like oh this fucking gross motherfucker. You know? yeah. You're just thinking like this like it. He the just guy, comes the, off the guy. He's just so nonchalant about it. Yeah, and there's just something about him that just naturally repellent. Um, in a way that feels or doesn't feel contrived, which again, for doing a villain like this, especially a movie you're trying to get a point across by like racism or prejudice, and like I, the issue I had with Dallas, uh, not Dallas, um, what was the movie that came out last year? Detroit. That's what I'm thinking of. Mm. Uh, where like you can very easily play this character too over the top and too cartoony to be believable. Um, Is that what happened with the villain in that movie? Or? Uh, debatably. Honestly, you can kind of go back and forth on that one, but they definitely played they played him up a bit more to the point where, at least I personally was kind of like, eh, I don't know. Um, especially, like, that's, I apparently I also found it after the fact that apparently it's also largely due to the fact that that was the account the other officers of that night gave that person. Ah. Uh. So that, that also played a part in that. But, like, no, in this case, like, you believe every second of everything that's happening in this movie. Yeah. 
especially the relationship he has with uh, the maid mm-hmm. in this movie in the movie that one that one scene uh, do you know which one I'm talking about yeah I can't remember the character's name but I know what you're talking about was it like Helen or something something like that, like that. Uh, either way it just goes and like you don't know where it's going but you feel disgusting the entire time it's happening yeah uh, and honestly that kind of goes for every scene his in he could be like flossing you're like oh you sick bastard uh, that's just the kind of character he plays and you like yeah. I was, I always forget the actor's name. Ray Fiennes? Yeah, Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes, I was close. Just, I, I, I don't know. I think it's... I can't remember if it's Fiennes or Fiennes. Well, either way. Tomato, tomato. Uh, he, he, does, he does not get enough credit as an actor. Uh, just overall. Because he is so damn good. Liam Neeson, too. I'm going to lean... Like, Liam Neeson's also great in this film. And... Oh, I feel so good. Who plays the accountant? Oh, that was uh, Ben Kingsley. Ben King... That was Ben Kingsley? Yeah. I did not know that. Yep, that was Ben Kingsley. I thought he looked familiar. Okay, okay. Well, Ben Kingsley, apparently. Uh, they all do phenomenal work. Um, yeah, it's a masterpiece for a reason. And yeah. it's it's still disturbingly relevant, which I don't know how to feel about personally. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was the other thing. There was a message kind of before this from mm-hmm. Spielberg. Yeah. That was playing about, talking about how, like, the fact that, like, there's some relevance today, and it's like... Yeah. It's like it is weird how like this came out for its twenty fifth anniversary, but at the same time it's like there is that strange cautionary tale behind it as well in terms of basically just don't let this happen again. And yet twenty five years later it feels like we haven't learned a damn thing. Well we thought we did and then apparently we didn't. And apparently the other people who thought well maybe it was misunderstood got a little bit more of a foothold than we should have let them. Oh god <laughs> it just became ultra relevant. Yeah, see? You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Yeah, this is this is like twenty five years later, it's still a hard fucking sit. Yeah. Oh, uh, what'd you think of seeing in Dolby Cinema? Um, like... I, I mean, you know more of the technical aspects of that than I do. Yeah. So I feel like you, pro- you probably got more out of it than I did. Uh, it was... For me, it was just interesting seeing, like, this almost true contrast, though. Like, it mm-hmm. really emphasized it and, like, kind of emphasizing that grid as well, which I like. So I mm-hmm. kind of like how it better enhance the cinematography in those aspects. I mean, I saw it, on, like, back when Netflix was still doing DVDs. So... <laughs> That's how I watched it for the first time. Nice. So yeah. uh, originally, it was my first time was gonna be when the when the 4K version came out, but it's like, ooh, big screen, even better. Yeah, I mean, if you, I, this is not a movie I go out of my way to watch very often. Yeah, kind of like The Hunt, <laughs> or like Twelve Years a Slave. It's like, you know, I'm good with one. Yeah. <laughs> like one viewing is good enough for me. Uh, and yet, but that that being said, these classics are worth revisiting for times like this, where you do just kind of need a stark reminder of. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. Fucking look at it. <laughs> That's kind of what I felt about Black K Klansman, which just got nominated for a Golden Globe. Nice. Uh, several, actually, I think, where, like, the end of that movie just played, like, I think it was, like, the Charlottesville rally. Was it Charlottesville or Charlottesville? I always forget. I think Charlottesville. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, where it just said, like, this is what it is. Fuck it. Like, it basically, like, that one basically holds your hand and goes, fucking look at it and this movie kind of does it this one in a more subtle and in a bit more subtle way than black k Klansman did mm-hmm. just in a like again but i have a high amount of respect for this is how careful it it deflects itself from any like over dramatization and criticism it could possibly receive mm-hmm. um and you can tell it's very well constructed around that because it's like yeah this is it what are you gonna do like uh, this is it deal like kind of like i don't want to say deal with it but just like Accept it, because this is what happened. Yeah. In a very matter-of-fact way. And the details in which it does so are subtle but shocking. Uh, like, emphasizing the tombstone, like, the tombstones they use as a, as a, like, a street, basically, or a pavement. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, like, just emphasizing the fences, or showing how they used to have it used to icicles, make water, stuff like that. Yeah. They're small details, but they add a lot to building this world. Yeah. And emphasizing how hard the day to day was. Yeah. Even then, you know, kind of like I like how well they're like, despite how many characters there were, because I can't remember everyone's names, except for Ishkar and uh, Schindler. And, I mean, they're all like hard to pronounce German names. 
Yeah, well, German, Jewish, like, and... Like, Poland, I guess? Yeah, Polish. Yeah. Uh, it was like... Well, it was just because there were so many. Like, yeah. they gave so many named characters in this thing. Which is why there's a list. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, no, like, I think... I'd like... No, you're right, though, because it's like... You never really have any problem following who's who. Yeah, like, they... And they do a good job, like, differentiating them. You know, giving them their own little unique personalities, little ticks mm -hmm. and tidbits. Or this, given that like these micro stories that you're instantly invested yeah. to and instantly understand, like the uh, part where they're evacuating the ghetto is a great example of this, because it's a solid like 23 minute sequence, and there's so many micro stories and so many like lo like micro events that happen in that whole sequence, and instantly whenever someone's introduced, you instantly know what they're about, what their story is, and it's all told largely visually in like minimalistic dialogue. So, like, for example, a guy's packing a suitcase, and he's, he says, we need to go to the sewers. Like, I don't want to go in the sewers. And they instantly kind of figure out, like, okay, that's that's their de You understand them pretty much right away. Mm -hmm. uh, or, like, the mother who gets, uh, who gets kicked, who basically gets forbidden from entering the floorboards, who has to run outside and runs into the little boy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Basically, another uh, Jewish child that was kind of like helping out the Nazis, and then you know, kind of knew who that was, and mm -hmm. like using that to establish relationships and the characters as well. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does such a great job in, uh, establishing that instantly that you never really like. It, it doesn't bother you. you. Don't you never ask any questions? You instantly like, oh, okay, that you 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 pick it up really fast, and you're and it the way it's presented gets you instantly invested. It's really like it's really impressive storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, honestly, because. Probably Spielberg's best, if I'm being honest, or at least in my opinion. Probably, like, I can't. I need to figure out which one his best is, but this is probably like it's up there. It's yeah. not his best work. It's definitely up there. Yeah, uh, it's basically a case of me. He's like, I got to go through like what they are and like, because like per genre, this is definitely his best drama. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I will say, I agree with that hands down. I'm not. Yep. I mean, he tried to capture a little bit with that with Lincoln, but even then, he kind of indulged in a little, one too many Spielbergisms in that one. Yeah, and that kind of dragged all of it too long in the ending there. No, I agree, and I, I like I liked Lincoln, but that was mostly because of uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like he's—I don't think he's ever as as far as dramas go, he's never really been able to surpass this one. And I, honestly, I don't think he's tried because I know he went to a dark place to make this movie. Yeah, like he didn't even want to make it at first for a while. Mm, and like he tried to pass it off to a bunch of people. Um, like I remember, like from what I read, Scorsese was one of them, and like that was part of the deal where like he would take Cape Fear and uh, or Scorsese would take Cape Fear and uh, God, what? or something like. Spielberg wanted to direct Cape Fear, and he would have Scorsese direct this, but they mm. ended up, like, switching on something else or something like that. Mm. But, either way, man, I mean, f f fuck. Yeah. <sighs> I'm... talk about trailers? <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just more like, I was just gonna say, like, I'm, I'm disappointed that we still have to talk about the relevancy of this movie. <laughs> As far as trailers goes, we only got two. <laughs> what the hell are they again? Uh, Welcome to Marwin and, and on the basis of sex, which we talked about both already. So not yeah. really much a reason to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one looks like just shameless Oscar bait. Actually, and from what I'm hearing, based on the reviews, it most certainly is. Which one? On the basis of sex? Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Uh, you you know when it's shameless Oscar bait when they're much more focused on the message than the characters. Yeah. Which the basis of sex definitely looks like this because there's no lines in that trailer and I'm willing to bet the movie where it's not about women's rights. Which, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to talk about in imagination. It's more like, okay, you could do that and have characters. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah. And Marwin... I'm curious about. The more I see those trailers, and I've gotten this trailer a lot, uh, the cheesier it looks to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's where we get the Zemeckis Zemeckisms. Uh, oh, is, which one is Mecha make? I'm trying to... Robert Zemeckis. What has he made? Back to the Future. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see that. That makes that has some context then. Yeah. And also, he did quite a bit of those CG mocap movies like Polar Express. Oh, God. Uh, Christmas, Christmas Carol. Carol, yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Steve Carell's going to give a great performance in it, but yeah. especially when I look at the CG scenes, like, oh, God, this looks so cheesy. Uh um, but other than that, yeah. Um, 
Schindler's List, would you recommend it? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's almost 11, so I think it's time for us to call it a night. So, Yay, sleep! Yay! What is that again? Uh, I don't know. It's a mythical fairy tale from what I've heard. I heard it involves pillows and bed sheets. Yeah. And not having pains in the middle of the night. Oh, God, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. All right, it's not just me. All right. It's like, oh, God, am I really getting that old? I can't go to bed without fucking back pain now. Well, it makes you feel better. I basically got arthritis in my neck, so oh, that God. sucks. Damn, that does suck. Well, I mean, at least you don't have a torn ligament on your hand. <laughs> Why'd you flip off too many people? <laughs> it was really intense. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's fool was a tough set, is all I'm saying. It's like, it's like I extended my middle finger so hard and gripped my other so tight. <laughs> it just... <laughs> oh. <laughs> that sounds worse than what actually happened. <laughs> No, seriously, like, uh, like I, I have more pillows now, like special pillows, than I've ever had in my entire life. I had one pillow from like, till, from like five till I was twenty-two. <laughs> now I have one to bend my knees right, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> so they don't lock yeah. up while I'm sleeping. I got one so I can lay down the bed post so my back doesn't hurt. Yeah. I got another one that's supposed to align my neck so I can sleep properly without mis just misaligning my spine. So I'm probably gonna need one of those. That's actually I'm, do good. I'm doing the towel thing where like you wrap it up and put it right around the right below your neck. Oh, there's a great one on sale right now. I think it's like for like 20, 30 bucks. Yeah, <laughs> we, got knee, we got knee pillow, neck pillow, head pillow, body pillow. Wait, what? <laughs> uh. That's for the nights get really long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yay, laughter. All right, so uh, it's, it's still got to check out the possession of something grace or whatever Candy it is. Grace. I'll, I'll probably check it out over the weekend. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't even know what com fucking comes out next week, so we'll, we'll. see. Let us see, shall we? God, I'm glad we watched a good movie today. Uh, it's, I know it's supposed to, it's a pretty slow week from what I understand. I would understand that. Don't know why. I did Unless that you guys want to watch 2.0. <laughs> uh, that's a bunch of independent films. So maybe we'll actually get to see some good stuff. Oh, and in the apocalypse. Tell me that's actually going to be out. Uh, I think it's already out. I don't know if it's playing around here, though. Um, It will be, and that's only in San Francisco. Never of mind. Of course it is. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of indie movies coming out, so maybe we'll go check out a couple of those. It's definitely Oscar season is in full swing. I just know I'm fucking dreading the 21st. Why is that? Because that's when everything comes out. Oh yeah, I remember making a comment about that. <laughs> Where I was like, God fucking damn it, December. <laughs> well, Alfonso Cuaron's got a new movie out. Who yeah? Alfonso Cuaron, the guy who did uh, Gravity and oh, all that. Cool called Roma, but of course it's on the SF area. Of course it is, bastards. Uh, maybe we'll go wide Children in a few men, weeks. there we go. Maybe we'll go wide in a couple weeks. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you guys for watching. Uh, see you all later.